Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. I'm excited to be able to continue on, uh, as our host mentioned, uh, in our series today. Uh, as you uh, may or may not be aware, but if you've been with us for a couple of weeks, you'll know that we've been working through a series of messages that we have called Summer Highlights. Uh, the inspirations from your favorite verses. Uh, Now, for each of us, as we approach the Bible, uh, all of us are on our own journey towards Jesus, and we find these verses that stick out to us. Uh, As we go through the Word, we we see something that inspires us. Uh, Maybe it inspires us to push hard when we want to give up. Uh, Maybe it inspires us to be better uh, rather than just staying the same. Maybe it inspires us to forgive or to speak truth or to love even when we don't want to. And that's what I love about this series is it gives us the opportunity to look at these inspirational pieces of scripture and to be inspired by uh, verses that maybe we hadn't noticed before or maybe uh, for me, uh, it gives me a greater depth of uh, what we are noticing and a greater depth in these scriptures themselves. Now, what I find interesting is that we tend to have this habit, uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, nowadays we've made this switch that we used to just kind of highlight these verses, uh, and then we kind of kept them to ourselves, but uh, we get this uh, thing now with Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram and all these, and we just start blasting these, um, uh, these memorable verses out. And so I love the fact that now these verses don't just inspire us. Uh, They inspire uh, everybody around us, uh, whatever feed we get it on. And it was uh, at the beginning of June uh, that we asked all of you to let us know what your favorite verses were, and so that's really where this series came out of. It came out of those cards, and so I'm excited to be able to do that. Uh, But before we move on, I just want to thank Pastor Dustin uh, and our elders, uh, Shola and Paulus, who've spoken over the last few weeks. Uh, really uh, done a great job and inspired us out of some of these favorite verses. So let's give them a hand this morning. All right. This mic's a bit loud for me, if you guys can just bring it down. Thank you. Now, earlier this week, I conducted an experiment on myself. It was completely by accident. Uh, But I did nonetheless, I I got into my car and I'm driving to work uh, and I'm coming from Cochrane, so I have about a 20 minute commute. And I noticed about halfway there, about halfway between Cochrane and Calgary, I noticed something that uh, that I hadn't noticed before and I don't know why I didn't notice it, uh, but I noticed that the radio in my car was turned off. Now, for me, that's very strange. It's like, the sec- it's like the first button I push when I turn the engine on, uh, if it isn't already turned on already. Uh, and so I did find it a little odd that uh, it wasn't on. And I thought to myself, I'm going to try something here. This is the experiment I'm going to do. I'm going to leave it off for the rest of my, my commute this morning and see what happens. Uh, and I-, I was amazed Uh, about what happened, and and it really surprised me because, you know what I found out? The quiet was hard. It was really, really difficult to just sit in silence. I'm so used to the distraction of the radio. I wasn't used to it. I wasn't used to giving my brain the opportunity to just think on the drive. But there was something else I noticed when I wasn't Uh, driving with that distraction in the background, that noise in the background, is that I began to notice my surroundings. Uh, The commute from Cochrane to Calgary that day, you could see the mountains so clearly. And there was this fog that just hung over the river valley. So up on on the uh, Highway 1A, it was completely clear, nothing to worry about, but you just look to the south, and the river just had this thick fog sitting on it. It almost felt like you were floating uh, above the horizon. And as I sat there and I began to ponder all these things, I began to wonder what else in the world was I missing because I was distracted. And as I thought through this process, I realized, you know what, it's probably a lot. 
there's probably a lot I'm missing, maybe unconsciously, just because I seek distraction. And the crazy thing is, I know I'm not alone in this. We all find ourselves incredibly distracted in this world. And while the things that we have uh, inherently can be useful, they can be entertaining, they can be helpful, our inability to set them aside has allowed us to get to this point where we are endangering our very souls. Sebastian Junger, in his book, Tribrate, makes the point that there's something about our modern society today that has become toxic, that for all of our science and our technology, for all of our education and medicine, modern society does something to the soul. And while our society and culture has always had that group, that is, every time we have switched from kind of one uh, generation to the next, there's that group of critics that cry out, oh man, I just wish we had the good old days. But I think as we enter into this kind of modern society, maybe we should be paying attention to those critics. Maybe they have a point. Now, I love to study history I listen to history podcasts, I read history books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction. I just, I just love history. In fact, my wife and I will take our reluctant children to museums just for fun because we love history so much. And through that study, uh, and many of you may be familiar with this, with history, is there are certain points, certain dates, certain key uh, inflection points in history where we look back and we go, that was the moment that things changed. Uh, and so, what, before we jump into something this morning, I, I want to ask, uh, and maybe do a little bit of a pop quiz here on how much you guys remember from your history classes. I know, for some of us, that's been a while, right? Uh, and so, what I want to do is I'm going to put up, I'm going to ask you guys some questions, specific dates, and I want you guys to respond. I want feedback uh, in regards to what these dates might mean, uh, and you need to get it nice and loud so that I can hear it up here. Now, this first one hopefully will be pretty easy, uh, and so we'll throw out the date, and then you guys can just yell out, and no cheating, no going on Google, right? Let's just see what you can remember. Uh, so the first one uh, is the year 30 AD. I heard it over here somewhere. Is that is the year that tradition holds that Jesus died and rose again. We don't know the exact year, but it, that's when most uh, historians believe that it happened. Uh, now, the next one, the year 1440. There's a quiet room on that one. That was the year that the Gutenberg Press was invented. For those of you that don't know what the Gutenberg Press is, that was the first set type printing so that they didn't have to copy things over and over by hand. It's what made the Bible readily available uh, to the masses uh, and really was part of the start of the Reformation, uh, which changed church history forever. Uh, this one should be pretty easy. Uh, there's a poem that goes with it as a bit of a hint. 1492. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I think we all remember the poem, right? Uh, so that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, some of these, now I'm going to give you some specific dates. This might get a little bit harder, but this is in the last century. Uh, so December 17th, 1903. I, what was it? Nope. First, World War I was happening at the time, but... Sorry, 1903. Sorry, I'm thinking of the next one. I just gave you a hint for the next one. <laughs> December 17th, 1903. It was the first flight. The Wright Brothers, North Carolina. Uh, which is kind of crazy when you think that the first flight was just over 100 years ago and how far we've advanced in such a short period of time. Now, this one, I'll give you a bit of a hint, but no, <laughs> it's not World War I. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor uh, the date that will live in infamy, as we so famously know. Uh, all right, this one, this next one is a little bit more recent. It came in my lifetime, uh, and I remember this very clearly, seeing this on the television and the newspapers. November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall, fall of the Berlin Wall. 
Uh, it was the beginning of the collapse of communism, the re reunification of East and West Germany, uh, and quite a momentous uh, day when they declared that, you know what, the wall has to come down. Now this last one, I'm going to give you a bit of help on this one because it, it's a little bit harder, but because there were three events that happened this year. Uh, and if you get any of those three, that's great. Uh, and the year is 2007. Michael. Oh. Bang on. I'm hoping you're not in the first service and you just got my answer. <laughs> that was the year that Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone to the world. It changed everything. Right? That's the beginning of smartphones, the beginning of this kind of digital in society that we have. But there were two other things that happened that year. And I'll just give them to you uh, for the sake of time. Uh, the first one uh, is that Facebook became open to the public in 2007. So before that, it was a, a platform just for colleges and universities. But in 2007, they opened it up to the public. All you had to have was an email address, and you can get in. And the other one that happened that year is there was a little micro-blogging website called Twitter that launched that year. Uh, and all three of those technologies, the iPhone, the smartphone, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, they have revolutionized our world in just 11 short years. And I don't know if it's official yet, but I think 2007 might end up being one of those years, one of those inflection points in history when we look back and we go, that's when society changed, that's when culture changed. Because it was at that point that we launched into what I would call the digitally immersed society. That's when it just kind of took over everything. I mean, we had computers before, but they weren't in our pocket, right? We had the ability to communicate with one another, but we couldn't do it so easily uh, as we can nowadays. I mean, my teenage years, I grew up in the 90s, uh, and for those of you that are too young to remember the time uh, before these technologies were at your fingertips, we had something that we, we had to do. Now, just an aside, I saw this great video on Facebook this week where there was a bunch of teenagers trying to figure out a rotary phone. <laughs> I just, I loved it. But anyways, when, when we were in the 90s, we, when we were in a line, uh, when we were on an airplane, maybe we were in the passenger seat of a car, we had this wonderful thing that we all had to cope with. Uh, it was called boredom. I mean, we didn't have phones in our pockets. We didn't have this. So we had to actually talk to somebody in a line, right? Whereas now you see somebody in the line and what's the first thing you do? You pull out your phone out of your pocket and you're, you basically get immersed in this digital society. You don't have to talk to anybody around you. We can't even imagine the scenario anymore where we stand in line and talk to somebody. I mean, it's just crazy. A 2015 study of young adults found that participants were using their phones five hours a day up to 85 separate times. Five hours on your phone. And when they asked them, they said, well, do you realize how long you've been on your phone? And they said, actually, no. We thought maybe two hours, maybe two and a half. And they were hitting Five hours. Think about that. That means one-third of their waking hours is spent staring at a screen. One-third. That's almost as much as we sleep. Five hours a day. Now, all of these technologies can be good, like I said. They can be helpful. They can be useful. There are pros to all of this stuff. But this technology has decreased our attention span. We have become a more distracted society. And it's not just robbing us of our ability to effectively communicate with other people, to be fully present in the moments as they come by us, but it's also robbing us of our ability to engage in meaningful communication with God. Andrew Sullivan wrote a provocative essay for the New York Magazine that he entitled, I Used to Be a Human Being. The essay opens up with him checking into a rehab center, dropping his phone into a basket to be locked away in what is essentially a digital detox. It's a very interesting read as he writes about the dangers of our plugged-in society, and he concludes his essay with this statement. He says, there are books to be read, 
landscapes to be walked, friends to be with, life to be fully lived. But this new epidemic of distraction is our civilization's specific weakness. And its threat is not so much to our minds, even as they shapeshift under the pressure. The threat is to our souls. At this rate, if the noise does not relent, we might forget we even have any. Jesus said in Matthew 16, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Now, it sounds harsh, but I feel like we're trading our souls for free Wi-Fi. <laughs> this tiny little piece of plastic and metal has taken over our lives. Now, in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel faced a situation not unlike our own, where their souls, their very lives, were in jeopardy. And I love how, despite there being thousands of years between them and us, we can still find a solution to our epidemic. It is in this story that God reveals to us how we can get ourselves out of this mess. And like I said, even though we're in the same situation, or not in the same situation, the solution is the same. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus 14, and I know I've basically berated you for cell phone use. It's okay to pull those out right now. <laughs> turn them on, jump on to Exodus chapter 14. For those of you that are new to the Bible, the book of Exodus is the second book in, uh, so it'll be pretty easy to find. Now, the book of Exodus is the famous story of Moses uh, by the direction of God interceding on behalf of the nation of Israel who have been trapped in slavery uh, by the Pharaoh and then the nation of Egypt. And God sends a series of plagues, all of them affecting only the Egyptians. And Pharaoh finally relents. He finally says, enough is enough. You can go. Go to your promised land. And we pick it up here in chapter 14. The Israelites have arrived at the edge of the Red Sea. They have got their flocks. They've got their herds. The scripture actually tells us that they plundered Egypt. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh changes his mind and he begins to pursue them to recapture them, to put them back into slavery. And so we have them stuck up against the Red Sea and Egypt's army pursuing them. They obviously cry out in fear, and then Moses makes this statement in verse 13. And this is going to be our focus today. It says, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. It's at this point that God parts the Red Sea, the Israelites cross on dry land, and the Egyptians drown as the sea crashes back over them. Now, if you think about it, in our society, we are stuck just like they were. Stuck in a difficult place. We're stuck in a entrenched, disenchanted, digitally addicted word and in, uh, world. And in that point, God is saying to us two things. Saying, fear not and stand firm. Can you repeat after me? Fear not, stand firm. Fear not, stand firm. And then he provides us with the answer. He said, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be Silent. Wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. The answer is silence? God promises that he will fight for us. It means that if you're looking for financial breakthrough, he will fight for you. If you're looking for healing, he will fight for you. If you're looking for employment, he will fight for you. If you're looking for wisdom, he will fight for you. If you're looking for a strengthening of your marriage or, or a better relationship with your kids, he will fight for you if you are 
silent. It's no wonder that when we are crying out to God and we feel like we aren't hearing Him, it's because we have become so accustomed to filling our lives with noise, with distraction, with our Facebook feed, with the latest news or blog or whatever it is, we have lost the ability to be quiet and to listen. I was talking with William, our discipleship director, about this this week, and the realization that I came to this whole area uh, a couple of weeks ago. See, I wake up every morning and I do my best uh, to spend time with God. I'll spend some time in worship and I will read the Bible and I will journal and make sure that I've got kind of my thoughts processed for the day and I'll spend some time in prayer going through my prayer list and making sure that I'm praying for the church and praying for my family and, and praying for my needs and praying for all of this and then all of a sudden I jump up and I go on and I think I've had an incredible walk with God today. This is awesome. My day has started perfect. This is amazing. But did you notice that I missed something in the whole process? Where did I stop and listen? Where did I give their time to be a two-way conversation? The whole thing for me was about getting through my process. And I didn't stop to see what He, God, the maker of the universe, my Savior, had to say to me. It was a humbling realization. And I've started to make changes. I've started to make room. The Bible makes it very clear that the promise of this verse, that the blessings of God and our ability to be silent are intricately linked. Psalm 46.10 says, be still. Let's try that again. Be still and know that I am God. In these verses, being still means to wait. It means to be lazy, to relax, to desist. And I love this one, to have courage when losing heart. Lamentations 3 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And Isaiah 30, verse 15 says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. The scriptures are filled with this call over and over again that we must seek silence. But even more than that, we have to seek solitude. Silence is straightforward. I think we all understand silence. It's being quiet. But solitude is taking it a step further and purposefully being alone with God. And what I love is that Jesus was the master of this. He understood that despite the chaos of the world around him, the importance of the calling, the push of the crowds, the questions of the disciples, that time alone with God was key to staying connected and seeing the fulfillment of his ministry and time here on earth. I mean, right before Jesus starts his ministry, he comes out of the shadows, he's baptized by his cousin John, and then immediately he goes into the wilderness. He doesn't jump right in. He doesn't preach one of his amazing sermons to thousands of people. He doesn't share a parable with his disciples. He doesn't heal. He doesn't confront the priests and the scribes. Instead, he goes into what the Bible refers to in Greek as the oremos. Our Bibles translate this to be the wilderness, but it can also be understood as the deserted place, the desolate place, the solitary place, or the quiet place. It is only after he spends this time with God, then he launches into what God has called him to do. But this frame of reference, this Aramos, becomes a constant theme woven into the very fabric of his life. Verse after verse, scripture after scripture, Jesus does amazing things and then escapes into the wilderness. He feeds the 5,000, he goes into the wilderness. He heals somebody, he goes into the wilderness. He teaches his disciples, he goes into the wilderness. 
In fact, the story, right after he uh, comes out of the wilderness, he's been tempted by Satan, he goes right into work, he, he does this amazing ministry, and then he tries to escape to the wilderness, and he can't. The crowds follow him, he gets on this boat, and they follow him, they find out where he's going, and when he gets to the other side, they're there waiting for him. And it says right there that he had compassion on them and he served them. But as soon as that was done, as soon as he finished, he escaped to the wilderness. He saw it as his priority. Mark 1.35 says, Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place, the Eremos, where he prayed. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, the Eremos, and prayed. Luke 6, 12 says, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples and chose the 12. His ability to go into the wilderness always, always, always precedes and goes after every major moment in his ministry. Healing, preaching, sharing, calling his disciples, whatever it is, the Eremos is present. Matthew 14, 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew by boat to a solitary place, the Eremos. It didn't matter what was going on in his life. He sought it out. And it's not like Jesus didn't like crowds. We know the opposite was true, that he loved them, that he had compassion on them. But the busier he became, the more demand that was placed upon him, the more famous that he was, the more he withdrew to the quiet place, to the Eremos, to pray. Now, if you're anything like me, and I know you are, when we get busy at work, when we get busy with family, we do the exact opposite. We get home from work, we rush through dinner, we get the kids in bed, and instead of spending the time in the Eremos like we should, we throw on Facebook or we throw on Netflix. We fill our empty moments with noise instead of seeking silence and solitude. We do the opposite of what we're supposed to. We do the opposite of what Jesus, by example, taught us to do. So obviously something has to be fixed. Henry Nguyen, the Dutch theologian, said it like this. He said, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. Therefore, if silence and solitude are this important, we need to start making the necessary, the intentional, the practical changes in our lives to institute this in a viable way, something that's going to last. Do you agree with me? We've got to start making some changes. So before we move on, I just want you to turn to the person beside you. And this might be easier said than done, although some of you might enjoy this. Turn to somebody and say, I'm ready to be quiet. So I want to take a look at both of these things, the silence and the solitude, because these are both things that we have to seek. So the first thing is that I must seek silence. Now, silence does seem pretty self-explanatory, but there are two dimensions to this that both need to be considered. The first aspect is what I would call is the external silence. This is where we put ourselves in a place where there is no noise or as little noise as possible. That means no music, that means no TV on in the background, no radio going, no child watching Netflix down the hall. Now, just a caveat to that, I've used Netflix with my kids so that I can get the quiet time. Right? But the point of the fact is to try and eliminate the noise. If that means you need to go out in nature or early in the morning before anyone else is awake or if you're a night owl like me, waiting until the house has fallen asleep. That hush comes across the busy day, and you can enjoy the quiet all by yourself without distraction. Now, this part can be hard, especially when we get started, because we are so used to the noise. The silence can unnerve us. But we need to push through. 
And just one quick note on this. This discipline can be very easily added to what we would call our devotional time where we're reading the Word and we're spending time with God. But it shouldn't be overtaken by those things. And that was the realization that I came to, that I was spending an awesome time with the Lord, but those things kept overtaking my moments of silence. It, is, it has to be considered a separate and very important aspect of our communion with God. Now, the other side of this is what we would call is our internal silence. This is the ability for us to get past the mental clutter that just won't slow down. And the interesting thing is, is when we get these moments of silence, it only seems to intensify. This is what I was gripped with uh, when I was on my car ride, my commute from home to work. The world was silent. My brain was not. It's like I gave it permission to start going into overdrive. Right? David Foster Wallace, the American author, calls it the terror of silence. I think it's a, a very appropriate saying. Because whether we're willing to admit it or not, we like the chaos. We look for the email. I mean, I was talking with a gentleman in the first service. He said the first thing he does when he wakes up is checks his phone. I mean, a lot of us do that, right? First thing, what, what, what happened overnight, right? We like the, looking for the email. We like getting the to-do list done. We like getting rid of the sink full of dirty dishes, the to-do list. For me, it's getting rid of those little red numbers on my iPhone that tell me I've got a notification, right? I've got to know what's going on, what's happening. I've got to get rid of those notifications. Anything that turns our attention away, but I'd encourage you with this, don't get discouraged. That's normal, right? It's called a discipline for a reason, and that means we have to reteach our minds to be calm, to be still, to be empty in the good way, and therefore in tune to finally listen. We have to practice, even if practice starts off poorly, I read an article earlier this week that when we begin to go into silence and solitude, we need to think of it as a, a violinist who begins to play the instrument. The first few times they play, they're not playing music. It's hard. It's difficult. They have to learn before they can play beautiful music. And the same is going to be true for us when we step into the silence. We have to practice. We have to push through. Because even time fill, filled with a meandering and wandering of a busy mind is better than being overcome by the distraction of this world. We have to make the space. And that leads me to the second thing is that I must seek solitude. Now to clarify, solitude does not mean loneliness. It doesn't mean isolation. We may not be with people, but it doesn't mean we're alone. God is with us in those moments. He's seeking out those moments in our life. Wayne Cordero, in his book, Leading on Empty, writes, there is a difference between isolation and solitude. They may have similar characteristics, but in reality, they are worlds apart. Solitude, solitude is a chosen separation for refining your soul. Isolation is what you crave when you neglect the first. The ability to be in solitude can be just as easily done on a walk as it can be huddled in a room. The point is to be quiet and to be focused on what God wants to say. Instead, we tend to fill it with so much noise that we can't hear Him. It's a safe place with God so that He can finally cut through that cacophony of other voices. Maybe it's to help us determine a right perspective on a situation. Maybe it's to get the proper wisdom on the truth versus fiction in the stories that we're telling ourselves. Maybe we need to remove ourselves uh, so that we don't seek approval from other people to the point where it becomes uh, di uh, damaging to us. Instead, we need to come to that realization and hear him speak that we are a child of God and that we don't have to seek approval. We already have it. Maybe we need to find a place of freedom in life instead of being weighed down by it. 
in that moment of solitude, we know Him, and He knows us. What an incredible privilege to be known by God. I know this is countercultural. I know it can be difficult to accept and difficult to do, and it is. But that's why it's called the discipline. That is what makes it work is when we push through, when we get through the hard stuff, when we begin to hear the two-way communication, that becomes life-altering for us. That's what makes it so vital for us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why this discipline is one of the things that is being attacked in our society because the enemy wants nothing better than to fill our heads so full of noise that we can't hear our Father and our Savior anymore. It's at this point in time we have to make sure that we seek silence and solitude so that we can spend time with God. And if you're sitting here today, and I'm speaking to everybody, whether you know Jesus or whether you don't know Jesus, we all need to hear from him. We all have concerns in our life. We all have pressures in our life. We all have people in our life that need healing or maybe they need a breakthrough in, in prayer. Regardless of what it is, we need Jesus. And if we don't have that opportunity for him to speak into our lives, we're missing out. Maybe we're missing that key prayer that we need to be praying. Maybe we're missing that key piece of wisdom that says, apply here, don't apply here. We have to seek Jesus out. We have to make room in the quiet for silence and solitude. And if you haven't accepted Jesus into your life yet, that has to be the first thing. You can sit in quietness, you can sit in stillness, but you will never be able to sit in solitude because you will be by yourself. You have to invite Jesus in. You have to accept the fact that he loves you and wants to be involved in your life. It's that important. So this week, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a homework assignment. And I'm going to go through four quick steps on how to establish silence and solitude in your lives. Are we ready? First thing is identify in advance a time and place that works for you. What works for your spouse isn't going to work for you. Each of us is created in such a way that we need to seek silence and solitude in our own ways. Some of us, we can connect with God in, in, the, in nature. Sometimes, like I said, maybe you're a morning person, you get up and you're fired up and you're like, you know what, I can seek my silence now before the kids wake up. Right? If you're like me, when the hush comes across the house in the evening, you can seek that silence and solitude and begin to listen. Whatever it is, identify it. Find out what time of the day am I going to do this? Where am I going to go? Right? It doesn't have to be a closet or an office. You can, if nature fuels you, go do it in nature. Just find the time and the place. Get free of distraction. The second step for us is we need to set a modest goal. Don't think you're going to be able to jump in and spend an hour a day, seven days a week right off the bat. It won't happen. Set a small goal. Maybe it's 10 minutes of silence three to five times this week. The point is just to get started, to get it into practice, to begin to move into this area, to begin to retrain your brain. Now, if you're already doing this, if you're already finding silence and solitude, keep doing it. In some readings I read this week, they actually encourage those that are doing really well in this area, push yourself. If you're only doing it five or six times a week, do it seven. If you're only doing it for 10 minutes, do it for 20. Always push yourself because God wants to speak. He wants to talk to you. Now, this next step might be the hardest for all of us. So I want all of you, grab your phones, hold them up. You got them anyway because you're looking at the Bible. All right, everybody hold up your phone and you're going to repeat after me. I will put away 
my phone. This is the biggest distraction you will face when you're trying to do your silence and solitude. I always made the excuse with my phone, you know what, I need it because that's how I read my Bible, or I need it because that's how I get, engage in worship. And those are valuable elements. But do you know what happens when I put it on my desk and I try and have silence? Notifications. And it doesn't matter if it's on silence because then it just buzzes across my desk. And I'm going, okay, what's going on? What's happening in the world? I need to go find out. And it could be anything from a text message to a weather update to a sports score to version's verse of the day. It doesn't matter. My phone goes off incessantly. I have to turn it off. And I want to encourage all of you, if we're really going to seek silence and solitude, you're doing that on purpose, aren't you? Shane's actually calling me right now. I was wondering why my desk was vibrating. <laughs> like I said, it doesn't stop. We need to put away our phones. We need to seek silence and solitude. You know what I'm going to I'm going to put this right over here. <laughs> we have to seek it out and whether we admit it or not, the world will function for 10 minutes without us. Our kids can wait. Life can wait. There's a great story I read uh, this week about Charles and Wesley Stanley's um, mom. So as they were growing up as kids, these were incredible uh, English pastors. And they remember growing up, a household full of kids, and they remember their mom would grab her apron and pull it over her head. And that was a signal to the kids that it was time for silence. We can find the moments. We can seek them out. We have more important priorities in our lives. Amen? Which leads me to our fourth homework piece, and that is that we must set my mind on Christ. Silence doesn't do us any good unless we seek solitude. The point of this is to listen to him, to abide in his presence, to just be with him. He may not even say anything, but you're spending time with God. It's amazing how when you sit with someone you love, you don't have to say anything. Some of the best times with my spouse, some of the best times with my kids is when there's nothing said. When there's no noise, no distraction, and you can just be with each other. God didn't create us that way if that wasn't exactly the same way he wanted to commune with us. If your mind begins to drift, set it back into alignment. We have control. One of the things I like to do is I like to have a pen and paper beside me so that if something pops into my head, I can write it down, set it aside, and move on. I can get my mind back on Christ. Because if I don't have that pen, I don't have that paper, it pops into my head, and you know what happens? Don't forget it, don't forget it, don't forget it, don't forget it, don't forget it. And so I don't get the opportunity to spend time with God because I'm so worried about forgetting the important thing. So I write it down, I move on, I bring my mind back into alignment, I set my mind on Christ. Author Dove Seedman sums it up like this, and this is, it's a bit cheesy, but it makes the point. It says, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to reflect, to rethink, to reimagine. The Lord is urging all of us to develop the and institute this discipline of silence and solitude in our lives because this is the revolutionary step that we need to overcome everything that is going on in the world right now. We need to quiet the noise, to remove the distraction, to spend time with Him. The fact of the matter is, you can have a relationship with Jesus without silence and solitude, but I would challenge you today that that relationship isn't going to be of any depth. 
It has to go both ways. You have to create opportunities for him to speak into your life. Can you imagine for those of you that were married or those of you that are dating, if the entire conversation was just somebody talking to you and you never respond, it doesn't work. A depth of relationship with Jesus is utterly dependent upon silence and solitude. For each of us, it's time to start being quiet. Would you stand with me today? I'm going to pray, but specifically what I'm going to pray for is each of you to find the ability to institute this in your life and to persevere when it gets hard. I know for the past few weeks as I have begun to institute this in my life, it always seems like there is some sort of distraction that wants to come in when I've set aside that time. And it has become a focused discipline of myself to go, no, I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to take this time. Even if it's only five or ten minutes, I'm going to make sure I spend time with God. And so I want to pray for each of you that you find the silence and solitude and that you have the ability to persevere through it. And as we pray, if you want more silence and solitude in your life, if you want more of, of being able to hear God clearly, I'd encourage you to lift your hand and we'll pray together. God, we come before you right now and just, God, I am in utter amazement again of how you didn't just create us and leave us alone, but instead you desire relationship. You want to talk and you just need us to listen. God, I pray that as we seek you out, as we seek the quiet place, the eremos, the ability to have silence and solitude, God, I pray that we would be able to carve out the time in our schedule, God, because it is so important. Really, everything else can wait. This has to be our top priority, our relationship with you. And God, I pray for the ability to persevere, to bring the distractions under control, to bring our minds under control, to be able to focus on you. And God, to be able to hear you so clearly. God, we thank you for the quiet. We thank you for the silence. God, let it reveal a greater depth of relationship with you in these coming hours and weeks and days and months. Let us be intentional about seeking you out. 